Hey everyone, my name is Jenny. Welcome to Bear Creek AG's online service. Thanks so much for being here. We want to take a few minutes and share a few things with you and your family. So check this out. If this is your first time with us today, please take a few minutes to fill out as much of our Digital Connect card you are comfortable with. You can find our Digital Connect card in the main post section of this service. From there, you will see a link that will send you directly to the card. We look forward to connecting with you soon. If you consider Bear Creek your home church, whether online, in person, or a mixture of both, we want you to join our online campus. You can find the link in our comments or on the main post section of this service. Our online campus provides a welcoming environment when you can, where you can connect, grow deeper, and learn together as a church family. This is a provided safe space for you and your family for prayer requests, follow-up questions to our current sermon series, and just a place to stay connected with each other throughout the week. We have lots of Thanksgiving celebrations going on around Bear Creek this week. Starting tonight is the Young Adults Annual Friendsgiving at Alex T's house. Tonight at 6.30, contact Alex T's or Mallory Fuller for more information. Our youth, middle school, and high school group will be having a gratitude and grub night this Wednesday at 6.30 p.m. in the kids' building. Bring your favorite Thanksgiving dish to share. They will also have a guest speaker. You can contact Pastor JP for more information. And on Thursday, November 19th, our senior adults will have a Thanksgiving luncheon in the Fellowship Hall beginning at 11.30 a.m. Bring a side dish that pairs with turkey and come out to enjoy a time of fun and fellowship. You can contact Pastor Ben for more information. Our annual celebration of praise service will be Sunday, November 22nd. We will have water baptisms in this service. So if you're interested in being baptized, please go online to our main Facebook page or in our online campus to register. Once you have registered, we will follow up with more important detailed information. Don't forget to check in with us in the comments as well so that we know you're watching today. We always look forward to seeing all of your smiling faces pop up online. Good morning, everybody, and thank you so much for joining us here on our online campus. I'm coming to you first before our service this morning because I want to tell you about something very special that's taking place. Each year on the Sunday before uh, Thanksgiving, we have our celebration of praise service. This is a very special service where we look back on the previous year, in this case 2020, and we give God praise for what He has done in our lives and in our church. Now, looking back, you're probably thinking, what's there to give God praise about in 2020? Well, trust me, there is a lot of things that's happened, a lot of miracles that have happened in the lives of people who are associated with our church. And we're going to celebrate that, and they're going to be given testimony. But also on that day, we take up a very special offering called our uh, Sacrifice of Praise offering. And this offering is going to be used totally for renovations here at our church. We do this every year, and this year will be happening on November the 22nd. So how can you be a part of this? Well, there's two ways. One way we do this is everybody in the church will be given a praise card. And we want everyone to write down on this card or on, and or on a piece of paper everything that they want to give God thanks for the previous year, this year in 2020. 20. And then also that offering. Now, how can you participate in the offering? It's very simple. You can go on Tithely, and you can look up our church on a, it's a free download app called Tithely, and you can give that way, and you can just mark it Sacrifice Praise. Or you can be here in person and give it um, as we celebrate that day. And the third way is you could actually mail it in if you would like to. The point is, I'm not here to beg you to give. 
I'm just trying to encourage you to be a part of what God's doing because we have so much to be thankful for. And I just believe that we, there is a requirement. I think that maybe a requirement is not the best way to put it, but I believe there has to be a response to the goodness of God. And one of those ways is giving him praise with our lips. We're going to sing to him that day. We're going to have testimonies. We're going to have water baptisms that day. And we're also going to give unto the Lord um, as he leads. So please be a part of it. Be praying about it. We're not asking for equal giving. Or excuse, yeah, equal giving, but we're asking, asking for equal sacrifice. So I hope that you will be a part of this great day of celebration. Well, sit back and get ready because I'm about to bring the word to you. Have a blessed day. Well, it's good to see you, like I said this morning. I want to welcome everybody online. Glad you guys are joining us online this morning. I hope you have your Bibles of Psalms 100 because that's where we're going to pick up today. As the next couple of weeks, I'm going to be speaking about Thanksgiving, about gratitude, about appreciation. As you're turning to Psalms 100, let me, let me tell you a couple jokes. You okay for some jokes this morning? I'm going to get you laughing a little bit here this morning before, before I give you the medicine. Uh, I love to tell, I like, there's, let me put this, not that I love to tell, there are a lot of great blonde jokes out there. And right there, I, I got some ladies like, okay, here we go. But I really do feel bad when I talk, tell blonde jokes because we just assume that they're women. So, so I can tell blonde jokes, we're going to change it a little bit, and we're going to say blonde men today. Or we could say, since men don't blonde their hair naturally uh, or, or artificially, we might could say gray guys, okay, because I fall into that category. But, but here we go. Don't go there. All right. Brother Ben, at least you still have your hair, but we won't go there either. All right. Well, two blind men, or excuse me, two blind, two blind men find three grenades, and they decide it's important that they turn them into the police station. But one of them asked the other, what happens if one of them explodes? And the other blonde man said, well, we'll just tell them we only found two. <laughs> Y'all didn't like that one. Okay. Well, there was, this, there was this blonde husband who was getting a shower. And as he was getting a shower, his wife said, Honey, did you find the shampoo? And the blonde husband says, Yes, dear, but I'm confused. I've already got my hair wet, and it says for dry hair. I know, it would been funny if I said a, a blonde woman. I know. Anyways, we'll, we'll, we'll go on. The one about the two fishermen. No, no, I can't, I can't beat up on the fishermen today. All right. Well, we're only two weeks out from Thanksgiving. I don't know about you, but my taste buds are already on alert. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm trying to lose a few pounds so that after Thanksgiving I can wear my comfy pants. That's how bad it's gotten in my life. But, I, but I'm looking. Now you laugh at that. But I'm looking. It's the truth, though. <laughs> but I'm looking forward, so forward to Thanksgiving. Did you know that the very, you should know this, but the very first Thanksgiving in our country took place in October 1621, October 1621, when 53 pilgrims celebrated their first harvest in the New World, and they invited 90 Native Americans to join them, and they had a meal together celebrating the harvest. In 1863, President Abraham Lincoln proclaimed a national day, and this is his quote, Thanksgiving and praise to our beneficent father, who dwelleth in the heavens. And he said it should be celebrated on the last Thursday in November. And in 1870, President Grant made it a national holiday. Thanksgiving. We may have a holiday, but can I be totally honest with you? Thanksgiving is not an American thing. Thanksgiving isn't something that we created. If you look throughout the Bible, you will see that Thanksgiving is a big part of the godly person's life, the Christian's life. It may have began in 1961 by the pilgrims when they gave thanks, but we every day should be prepared to give thanks to God and show thanks to God. Every day we should have an attitude, as I like to say, of gratitude. And I don't know if you know this or not, but as we cultivate an attitude of gratitude or a thankful heart, one that shows appreciation, it actually attracts God. God is attracted to a thankful heart. When he sees that you appreciate him and you appreciate what he's done for you, he, he is actually drawn to you. And by doing so, you actually attract his blessings even more. We're going to look at that this morning. Psalms 104 says this, Enter his gates with thanksgiving. We enter his courts with praise. Give thanks to him. Bless his name. You know what I found about humanity and about us 
even myself, we're pretty needy people, aren't we? Now, anybody's a parent, you know your kids are needy. Well, it's interesting that God has the same picture relationship with us. He's the Father. We are His children. And sometimes we can just be needy people. We come to God all the time with our needs, our needs, our needs. And I wonder sometimes, do we ever approach Him with an attitude of gratitude? Are we really thankful? Because usually when He answers a prayer in our life, we're very quick to look at the next problem in our life without stopping and to give gratitude to our Lord. This scripture in Psalms 100 is referring to entering into the tabernacle where the presence of God was located. I don't want to go over the tabernacle as a whole, but just trust me that there was a process of getting into the presence of God. There was a process of getting into the holies of holies, which is where the presence of God would reside. But just to get into the courtyard, just to go through the gates of the tabernacle, it began with just having a thankful heart and then giving God praise for who He is and what He's done. And in fact, in those days, it actually cost you something. You would have to come with an animal that needed to be sacrificed just to show your gratitude to your Heavenly Father. Well, I don't know how many of you all know this, but I like to hunt. I actually got to go hunt for the first time this past weekend on Friday after seeing my mom and helping my dad around his house. I slipped off into the tree stand and just really got along with God, really got along with this message. I had a because of the wind, I had to set my ground blind, so I took my message with me, which I was thankful for. And Other than texting a few people, and me and Terry Seegers carried on a conversation about deer there for about an hour, but I was intermingling with the Word, and this place that I hunt, it's in Laurel Hill, it, it, it's almost like a Garden of Eden to me, and it's behind a gate. The land that I hunt, the hundreds of acres that I hunt, you can't just get into it. It's, it's got a fence, it's got cattle, it's got a pad, beautiful fish ponds, I mean, it's gorgeous. It's just a beautiful piece of property. But I am very privileged to have access to that property. But for me to get to it, I have to go through this big old beautiful iron decorative gate. And for me to do that, I pull up, and I mean, this is really nice. It's, I have a keypad over here, and I've got to punch in that code. And when I do, those gates open up. I drive into the presence of deer. It's deer haven over there. And fish haven, for that matter. You, you fishermen, the other day, I was, a couple weeks ago, I was over to go over there and visit with my mom and dad, and I said, I, did, I needed to go put a tree stand up, a, my, my ground blind, and while I was there, I took, my fish, I took one pole and a bag of worms, and within 30 minutes, I caught seven bass, all of them weighing over two pounds. It's just, it's just heaven to me. But for me to get there, I had to have the code to get into the presence of the fish and the turkey and the deer, you hear, and the cows, for that matter, Right? I, I, there's a combination. There is a key code. There is a way to enter into that presence, and it's the same way with God. There is a code. There is a way. There is a step that can be taken. You cannot bypass it. You can't climb over it. You can't dig under it. The way to get to the presence of God is through a thankful heart. It draws God. Because a thankful heart is a humbled heart. A thankful heart is an appreciative heart who understands what we have or who what you have, where it comes from. It really is an appreciative heart. Gratitude is how we enter to His presence. And because of that, God is attracted to it. And when God enters into anybody's life, when, when you enter into God's presence, there's always a blessing that He leads. Always. You look on our Sunday mornings where the Spirit of God moves in here. And, and just powerfully moved. It, it's like, I always want to encourage you, don't just come here looking for an answer to your need. Come here seeking a God and not His hand, but seeking His face, seeking His presence. And when you do, He always leaves a blessing. His Word says so. Leaves a blessing. In 2 Timothy chapter 3, Paul gives us some signs of the last days. We all know we're in the last days. We just got finished a series on the last days. But notice what he says. He says in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 2, he says, For people will be lovers of self. This just doesn't describe us today. Lovers of self, lovers of money, proud, arrogant, abusive, disobedient to their parents, kids. Ungrateful. Unholy. That does describe it, doesn't it? And what Paul is telling us is that the last days, the environment, the atmosphere, the disposition of society is going to be one of ingratitude. They will not be thankful for anything given to them or anything that's done for them or anything they already have. It will never be enough. See, it's an atmosphere of entitlement. God's not attracted to an 
an attitude of entitlement, but an attitude of thanksgiving. Oh, He will draw to you when you appreciate what He's other done for you. We need to have that kind of heart, not one of entitlement. When I think, I was doing a study for this message, and we're going to go through a lot of Bible study stories this, after, this morning. Oh, God, I hope that's not prophetic afternoon. Uh, but we, we, we're going to go over several of them. But when I was thinking about, you know, Lord, what, what is a great story uh, 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 in the Bible of someone who had a thankful heart, of someone uh, who was grateful? And when I got to thinking, Lord laid Ruth on my heart. You, you may not always think about Ruth when you think about someone who's grateful. But think about this. Think about Ruth's life and how she was thankful to God and how she attracted God's blessing. Ruth lost her husband. He died. Okay? Knowing that she lose her husband, she lost her father-in-law. So she lost two men in her life that were her providers. Now, you got to look at it from the context of the Old Testament. They were her providers. Women didn't work like they do today. And so they were leaning upon the, 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 the husband and the fathers to provide. They were the ones who owned everything, in other words. And so with it, when, when her husband died and her father-in-law died, her and her mother-in-law, Naomi, was pretty much left with nothing. Not only did they lose those two, but her sister-in-law, she moved away, a very close uh, confidant of hers, all right? And not only that, but they, they, like I said, they lost their livelihood, and they had to leave their home. They were not. Naomi was, was, uh, was a Jew who had gone to, to the, because of the famine, had moved out of Jerusalem, moved out of Israel. And, and, and so they didn't have anything. So the only thing Naomi could do was move back to Jerusalem, back to Israel. And, of course, Ruth went with her. But when they got there, they had nothing. They didn't have a home. They had nowhere to stay. They had lost it all. Now, when she and Naomi came to Jerusalem, not only were they destitute, they had nothing at all, nothing to eat, but because they didn't, Ruth was allowed to go out of the fields and glean. Now, I know I'm telling the story very quickly. I didn't even mean to go into the details. But she'd go out and she would pick the grain that the, the harvesters would leave or, or they would drop. And she was desolate just, just to eat each day, and she'd bring it back home. When Boaz, who owned the field, the owner of the field addressed her. She expressed an abundance of gratitude. I'm not going to go to the scripture, but you need to read the scripture. When he came up to her, when he approached her, she had a heart of gratitude. And what I have found out in life is that when we go through circumstances, when life puts us through, whatever is in you will come out of you. Whatever is in you, from the heart, the mouth speak, from the abundance of the heart. Whatever is in you, when you're going through a hard time, whatever is in you will come out. When life squeezes you, what you really believe, how you really feel, will come out in your actions, your attitude, and your words. What was Ruth's heart? One of gratitude. She could have made her case that Boaz owed her because of her suffering. You owe me because of my suffering. I'm poor. You're rich. You owe me. You owe me because I've taken care of your relative. Naomi was a relative of Boaz. You owe me because I've taken, I've left my country. I've lost all this. I've taken care of your family. You owe me. An attitude of entitlement. But she didn't. She was grateful. She's grateful that Boaz even noticed her. He noticed her. Well, Lord, who are you to even notice me? i I'm not even one of your own kinsmen. I'm not even one of your. I'm not even from your own nation here. Who are you? But thank you. She had a heart of gratitude. Uh, she had a heart of gratitude for his concern, for his kind words, for his generosity. If you know the story, he purposely told the harvesters, "Make sure you drop plenty of grain for her. I want her to get all that she needs." Grateful for his protection, she worked hard, and she was grateful for all the kindness showed to her. No matter how small that kindness was. You know what? God blessed her. God blessed her. God blessed her. She got a husband. She actually married. Great, great love story. You guys watch Bachelorette all you want to. You need to go read this story, ladies. And a few of you men. Yes, she got a husband who loved her. She got a house for her and her mother-in-law, Naomi. God blessed her with wealth. Blessed her with influence. This Gentile lady ended up being the great, great, grandmother of King David. Think about that. Think about how God blessed her because why? She had a heart of gratitude. And a heart of gratitude attracts the blessings of God when we're thankful for what He's already done. Over in Deuteronomy chapter 28, there's a great man. fact, it'll be on the screen at uh, 28. We're going to be going there if you want to turn to your Bibles. It's a story about the Israelites when they're entering the promised land. Uh, Joshua's about to take them across. Moses has been banned from going. And as, when they cross the Jordan and they enter in and 
He brings them to a valley, and God says, stop here, and, and I'm going to tell you how life is going to be in the promised land. You, you hear about the milk and honey, the great, all that, but let me tell you how you can stay in my good graces. And he said, if you'll follow me, if you'll listen to my voice, then I'm going to bless you if you live in the city. How many of y'all want the blessings of God? If you live in the city. He said, if you work in the fields, guess what? I'm going to bless you in the fields. Whew, I take that too, Lord. Let my gardens grow. Matter of fact, I'm going to bless your livestock. They're going to be healthy, and they're going to multiply. Whew, that's a sign of wealth. I'll, I'll take that too. Matter of fact, if you're, if you're married, your wives, their wounds will be blessed. You're going to have a lot of children. Don't know if I want that kind of blessing right now. But anyways, yeah, you know, God's basically saying, look, I will protect you. I am your everything. Whatever you set your hand to, I will bless it if you'll just obey me and listen to my voice. Wow, that's a great deal, God. But in verse 45, God tells the others what will happen if they don't listen and obey. And he starts listing the curses. Now, it's not that God would curse them as we think today. But what he's saying is, I have my hand over you as long as you obey me. I have my hand over you, and I'm going to bless you in everything you touch. But when you stop listening to me, when you stop obeying me, I'm going to lift my hand off of you, and the curses that are already existence in this world because of the fall of Adam and Eve are going to have an effect on you. See, there's a message in itself right there. And listen to what God says is one of the causes of him lifting his hand of them. He says it's an ungrateful heart. Deuteronomy 28, 47 says, All these curses will come to you. I'm on 45. They will pursue you and stay close to you until you are destroyed because you didn't obey the Lord your God or follow his commands and laws which I have given to you. These curses will be a sign and an amazing thing to warn you and your descendants forever. In other words, when, you're, when these curses fall on you, you're going to be assigned to generations that you didn't obey me, you didn't have my blessings. And listen to what he says in verse 47. You didn't serve the Lord your God with a joyful and happy heart when you had so much. Another translation puts it this way. Because you didn't serve the Lord your God with joyfulness of mind and heart and gratitude for the abundance of all with which he has blessed you. He said because you weren't thankful, because you weren't joyful, because you didn't appreciate what I've done for you, these things are going to happen to you. Show your appreciation, he says. And if you didn't, he would lift his hand of blessing and protection from them. See, the curses they, were, they would face would be the sign to the next generation, a generation. It's actually a sign to us today. When you read that story, it's a sign to us today that the Israelites were not grateful that the fact that God kept them in the wilderness safe for 40 years. This is the generation that goes into the promised land, that God, their shoes didn't wear out. Manna every morning would come, quail, right? Water from a rock or from whatever, wherever they, the protection from other countries and nations and armies. And, and what it's saying is that they are assigned to us that they were ungrateful for all that God had done for them. God lifted his hand of protection because they had ungrateful hearts. I don't think we truly understand how many things God protects us from. We see some of them, don't we? I tell you, for instance, last Monday night uh, after prayer, we still have prayer on Monday nights if you're interested from 6 to 7. I was on my way home, and, and we know the time has changed. It's dark, and I'm going down John Pitts. I'm minding my own business, doing my speed limit, because that's what I try to do. And suddenly someone pulls out in front of me. I mean, I had to hit my brakes and swerve and almost end up in the ditch. God protected me. I could see that instant where God says, no, it's not your time. I'm going to protect you, and I'm going to protect those kids as well that weren't paying attention, that were on their cell phone and not paying attention to what they were doing. But I wonder how many times he's done that, and I'm not even aware of it. And how many times he's done that for you and your children when you're not even aware that God has protected you from things. You had no idea what was going on in your life. See, that hand of protection. We have so much to be thankful for. For so much to be thankful for just like a heart of gratitude attracts God an ungrateful attitude repels God and his blessings so we need to work diligently on having a heart of gratitude I know you're not a to me this morning but I hope you're soaking this in and you say I have an attitude of gratitude attitude of gratitude I'm glad that this is just a reminder for those who don't it's just a self check today we need to cultivate an attitude. We need to teach our children and our grandchildren to always say thank you when something's given to them. Amen? We need to teach them. Creating and cultivating an atmosphere of at any time. You know what I find interesting, and I'm guilty of this. When, when we sit down to, to eat, we say we're going to bless the food. Why don't we give thanks for the food? 
I know you say that's what we do, but we need to be reminded we're there to thank God for that food. If it comes from God, it's going to bless us. We need to thank God for what He's given. Every day, and you get up, thank God for another day. When you face the trials and the troubles that you face, thank God that He's there to lead you and to guide you and to help you. When you go through the valley of shadow of death, thank God that He's there and His rod and stuff are there to protect you. It's an attitude of gratitude. It's being thankful for what God is doing in your life. Even when it looks like it's bad, thank God because He's not done yet. In Numbers 31, we have the story of the Israelites fighting the, the, the uh, Midianites. And what happened was is God instructed Moses to take a 1,000 men from each tribe. So 12 tribes, 12,000 men. He says, I want you to go towards the Midianites, and I want you to fight against them. The reason for that is because what the Midianites had done in a couple chapters earlier, and actually it was years earlier. How many of y'all remember the story of Balaam? How many of y'all remember the story of a talking donkey? Y'all need to get in your word. Well, Balaam was paid to curse the Israelites by the Midianites. But Balaam wouldn't do it. Remember, the donkey wouldn't let him go, and finally the donkey spoke and said, Look, you idiot, there is an angel with a, bla a flazing sword right there that's going to kill me and you. I'm not going that way. So Balaam would not curse the Israelites, but what he did, convinced the Midianite women to go down into the camps of the Israelites and have relationships with them and to intermarry, which was against God's word, against his law, against his principles. So now God said, Moses, because of that, I want you to get a thousand, of each, a thousand men from each tribe and I want you to go fight the Midianites. It's time for them to pay for what they've done to my people. Now let's read the story in Numbers 31, 48. This is after the battle. What, it's an amazing miracle took place. Actually, there's two miracles that took place. Then the officers who were over the thousands of the army, the commanders of thousands, the commanders of hundreds, came near to Moses. So now the battle's over. They're coming to give a report to Moses. And said to Moses, Your servants have counted the men of war who are under our command. And there is not a man missing from us. They were the smaller army. They go out and they said, we have come back and we have counted and we're not a man missing from us. And we have brought the Lord's offering. While each man found articles of gold, arm, armlets and bracelets, signet rings, earrings to make atonement for ourselves before the Lord. It goes on to say that the weight of the gold was 16,750 16, shekels. You say, what's a shekel? It's a measure of weight. Basically, most experts believe it's about 420 pounds of gold that they brought to the Lord as an offering. That's about $11.7 million in the days. Jody, we could do a lot with that, couldn't we, brother? Man, just a portion of that. $11.7 million in today's economy uh, went and they brought before the Lord. One single offering. Well, the reason why that's amazing, you got the miracle of not losing a senior sol single soldier, but it's also a miracle because it is believed that this, this offering was what we call the census or the atonement offering. If they ever counted the people, there had to be an offering. Or if there was an atonement you needed for, you had to pay an offering. You went before the, the priest and you made an offering. And typically that offering, according to Exodus chapter 30, it, it required that each person give a half a shekel, which in that time and day was about $5. Whether you're rich or whether you're poor, because of what you, you're given a census and it's atonement because they've been off the war. They've gone off and killed people in, in war. And so they would come and then said, but listen, they were supposed to only give $5 in the day's economy per person. If they had done that with their army, it would have been $60,000. $5 times 12,000 men. 60,000. Still a great offering, right? That's still a wonderful offering. But that's not what they've done. Understand what they've done. They came and they gave 195 times more than what was required from the Lord. See, they could have just doubled it. Well, I'm going to be a good soldier. It required $5. I'm going to give $10. You know what? I'm going to give four more times. Far time. I'm going to give 20. I'm just going to go ahead and give the Lord $100. No. Well, everything they found, they gathered up and they brought it to Moses, to the tabernacle, as an offering to the Lord. What an extravagant offering. What an amazing offering. Are they trying to pay God for his protection? Are they trying to pay God for his blessing? Are they trying to pay God for, for the victory? Absolutely not. It's because not a single man was missing. Not a single man died. They said, you know what? The Lord has blessed us. It demands us to respond to him, and I've got to go above and beyond what he's already done for me in giving to him because of what he's already done. Think about that. 
Think about that. I can see the amazement on the faces of the leaders as they were given the casualty reports. Trevor Rubin, report. Not a single man lost, sir. All 12,000 accounted for, sir. Judah, report. Not a single man missing, sir. All accounted for. All 12, wait a minute. Are you sure? Yes, sir. We've checked twice. It's your car. Give us a report. Sir, not a single man missing. Everyone go down the list, the list, the list. All, all 144,000 men. Not a single casualty. What a miracle. And they devastated Midianites. I imagine a holy hush settled on them as they realized what God has done, done for them. You know, today we're celebrating Veterans Day this week. Can you imagine not having to tell a single wife that she's a widow? Not having to tell a single child that they're fatherless? Not having to go to a single parent and say, I'm sorry, your son was, died in battle for the cause? I mean, think about that. What a miracle that God performed for his people. I don't know, maybe it started with one person saying, you know what, considering all God's done, I'm giving it all. Maybe another guy said, you know what, that is appropriate. I, I, I don't know how it began. I don't understand why, but all I know is they gave their all. And it was out of a heart of gratitude for what God had done that motivated their giving. It wasn't that they was buying God. The battle was over. It was, they were only required $5 a person, half a shekel. So they said, no. Because of what God's done, I've got to give it all. I've got to give it all. Think about Zacchaeus in the New Testament. Tax collector, Jewish tax collector, turncoat, sided with the Romans, taking taxes, cheating people out of their money. One day Jesus comes along, and Zacchaeus is a short guy, and he climbs up in a tree, and Jesus says, Zacchaeus, come on down. I want to go to your house today. I've got to have a word for you, with you. He goes into Zacchaeus, and the whole time he's there, the, the people there are saying, what's he doing eating with sinners? Doesn't he understand he's a tax collector? Nobody likes Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus can't even pay us to go to his house. And this man, Jesus, he must not be a prophet. He must not understand what Zacchaeus done. But Jesus nonetheless goes and he has lunch, sits down with Zacchaeus. We don't know what was said in the conversation. All we know that when Zacchaeus, when Jesus came out, Zacchaeus made this proclamation. He says, if I have cheated anyone, half of what I owe, I'm giving to the poor. Think about what he said. Half that I own, I'm giving to the poor. And if I've cheated anyone in any way, I will restore it fourfold. If I stole a dollar for anybody, I'm giving them $4. If I stole $10, I'm giving them $40. What, what's happening here? Is Zacchaeus buying Jesus' friendship? Is Zacchaeus thanking him, paying him for coming and, and sitting at the table with him and talking to him, taking time out of his busy schedule? No, something happened in the conversation. Zacchaeus understand who Jesus was, what Jesus was going to do for him. He realized that Jesus was the Messiah, and because of the fact of the time that Jesus spent with him and all that Jesus is doing for him, out of a heart of gratitude, he said, i got to give. i got to give him something. i got to do something in this because this isn't right for me to have this. I've got to give more than what I have. To bless the poor. It's a natural response, what? To a grateful heart. Well, in case you ain't got the message, there's one more story I want to talk to you about. What about the lady with the alabaster box? We love that story, don't we? Man, we just love, and it's a powerful story. It's over in Luke chapter 7, verses 36 through 43. But despair, I'm not going to read it. You know the story. A prostitute seeks out Jesus at the house of Simon, who's a Pharisee. Somehow or another, she heard that Jesus was going to be at this Pharisee's house. And she had to get to Jesus. We don't know how she heard about Jesus. We don't know if she had an encounter with Jesus out on the street somewhere and he shared who he was with her and, and forgave her. We don't know. We don't know if it's word of mouth. Hey, you need to meet this Jesus cat, dude. He is down with it. He's, he's healing people. He's, he's forgiving sins. I mean, you wouldn't. Be, we don't really know the conversation that Jesus had or how she found. But she just knew she had to get into the presence of Jesus because something had happened to her because of Jesus. She took a chance. She went into a Pharisee's house. We don't know how she got in. There's a lot of theories, and I've even preached some of those theories, how she got in. Nonetheless, she found a way in. And when she got to the room where Jesus was at, she falls behind him. They're lounging at a table, his feet behind him. And she begins to weep and wash his feet with her tears and dry his feet with her hair. And she kisses his feet. I can't even get my wife to touch my feet. She don't love me like, obviously, this woman loved Jesus. And then she 
this alabaster box. She don't do feet. This alabaster box. There's a, lot, there's a lot said about what that represents. I'm not here to decipher what it represents other than the fact that it was very valuable. It was probably all she really owned of value. She broke it over and she anointed Jesus with it. Jesus didn't stop that. And Simon, thinking to himself, says, you know, basically, if you understood who this woman was, if you truly, she's thinking, if he truly was a prophet, he wouldn't be letting this woman do this to him because she's a prostitute. She's a sinner. Jesus, knowing what Simon was thinking, kind of gave a parable story. You know, if you had two people, one owes you a day's wage and one owes you a year's wage, and the master forgives both. Who's going to love more? And of course, Simon says, well, you know, the one who was forgiven much is going to probably love more. And Jesus says, you're right. You're right. This woman gave her all. Her faith has made her whole. She's forgiven. That's why she gave. That's why she gave. She realized her state. She realized her situation. She, learned she could do nothing to give the stigma off of her. She's a prostitute. Her life changed. She became a follower of Jesus. She wasn't buying his forgiveness. She was already forgiven. She wasn't buying his love. She was already loved by him. What was it? It was an offering of gratitude. It was something she could give to show her appreciation for what Jesus had done. I wrote this down in closing. This woman's love, her gratitude and generosity was a response to, not the cause of her forgiveness. It was a response to, and not the cause of her forgiveness. Zacchaeus didn't give to buy Jesus' attention or approval. He gave because of, because of his grateful heart for what Jesus had done for him. The Israelite soldiers didn't give to, to buy God's protection. They gave because of his protection and his favor. Ruth didn't live her life as if she was entitled to anything. She didn't have much and yet was thankful for what she did have. It's living with an attitude of gratitude. I don't serve God or give to God to manipulate him, to buy his attention, to buy his blessing, to buy his affection. I am a sinner saved by grace. He deserves it all. See, the reality of this, this message isn't about trying to get you to give a big offering in two weeks. That's between you and the Lord. The reality of this message is to try to give you, help you understand you, He deserves your all. He deserves your life. He deserves everything you have. You can't outgive God. You can't buy God's love. You can't buy His forgiveness. But because it's freely given, not by works that man may boast, but by faith. Because of that, doesn't he really deserve it all? What is the old saying? And I'm, and I'm probably going to misquote this. Forgive me. You probably can quote it better. But it's foolishness, my paraphrase, for a man to hold on to something that he can't gain rather than let go. In other words, what the things you hold on to aren't yours anyways. Let them go. Give it all, starting with you. Because reality is, if you give him everything but your heart, it's not going to amount to much. It's not an honorable sacrifice. But when it begins with your heart, when it begins with your heart, when it begins with understanding, Lord, I'm nobody, but you're everything. Lord, I'm but a sinner, but Lord, you're God. Lord, I have done nothing to deserve the good things you've given to me, God. But you have freely given. Thank you, Lord. I can't outgive you, but what I have is yours. That means your bank accounts. That means your homes. It means your businesses. It means your jobs. It means your children. It means your grandchildren. It means your spouse. It means everything that you say I own, you lay it down to his feet as an offering unto him. You know what's amazing is when we do that, when we humble ourselves before him, he never fails to leave a blessing in our life. 
Reality is the things that you think you own aren't going to be blessed of God unless you give them to him and say, thank you. God, thank you for this, but it's yours. And Watch how he blesses what you give him. So let me ask you this morning. Do you appreciate all God's done for you? You don't have to raise your hand. You have to say yes. More of a rhetorical question. Doesn't God's generosity, though, demand a response from us? It demands a response from us. It demands that we do something to show our gratitude to the Lord. And it should be every day. But as a church, we do it once a year. As a nation, we do it once a year. But as a church, and we call it our celebration of praise. That's why that little card I hope that you got is so important. It's a love letter to Jesus. It's a thank you note. How many of y'all like getting thank you notes? Some of y'all like getting thank you notes? I try to write thank you notes to people as often as I can. I know today with text and all that, it doesn't, I still like a note written. That's why I love so much about your cards you guys sent me, writing personal notes. That means so much to me. And God's the same way. And that little praise card, you say, well, Pastor, you don't understand. I don't have a job. Or, Pastor, you don't understand the place I worked at shut down because of COVID. Or, Pastor, you understand my finances. Man, they're, they're, they're devastated for the storm. Pastor, you don't understand my health. Pastor, you don't understand. This is what I do understand. God is good. And he's, you're blessed if you'll just look for it and focus and magnify him. And he deserves our praise. He deserves our appreciation for what he has done in our lives and definitely in the life of this church. So that's what I want to encourage you to do, church. I think that I think the roast beef is done. I really, and I want you to think, I want you as a family, if you have kids and great kids, get together, and every one of you fill out a card. If your kids or grandkids can't write, write it for them. Johnny, what are you thankful to God for this year? And it may be, well, the school year last year was shorter because we got to go home, you know. Praise God. Thank you, God, that my school year was shorter. They need to learn appreciation to God. Make it an exercise, a practice for you all. And then on the 22nd, we're going to come and we're going to present them as unto the Lord, almost like this is the temple. But we know it's not. This is the temple. And this is the, the holies of holies. And this is where God dwells. But sometimes I think we have to express our thanksgiving verbally written out front, not for anyone else to read. I read them, but I'm the only one. We don't say, well, if I see a very unique one, I may say, hey, Sherry, read this one. This is great. You don't have to sign them. But I want every person to be able to come down and make that sacrifice of thanksgiving to the Lord. And if God so tugs your heart to give an offering, give the offering with it. I'm not here to beg you for money. I'm not here to beg you for the offering, the money part of it. Pray about that but you definitely have something to be appreciative about to God. Amen. Father God, I thank you so much for your word. Lord, today, as it, this week, as I was preparing for this, God, it pricked my heart. And God, sometimes I'm a complainer. Sometimes, Lord, all I can do is complain about my circumstances, my situation. Father, without really seeing how blessed I am, God. And I, Lord, I, I repent. God, you know, you and I had some heart-to-heart -heart discussion this week, Lord, and I've repented, God. And Lord, I, I say it again, forgive me. Lord, for being so selfish or feeling entitled, God, to anything, Lord. I don't deserve. Lord, what I do deserve is punishment. What I do deserve is death because of my sinful nature. But, Lord, because of your grace, God, you took that upon yourself. And I thank you. So, God, I have all the reason in the world to be thankful today. And I pray, God, for this congregation and those who are watching online today. God, that you will help them see no matter what the circumstances they are, no matter what the situation is, God, they are blessed by you. 
Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thanks so much for being here online with us today. If today's message touched you and you haven't given your life to Jesus, we believe today is the day. All you have to do is pray. Admit to God that you have sinned. Believe that Jesus died for you and confess that Jesus is Lord of your life. If you prayed that prayer to God today, please reach out to us and let us know. We have some digital resources that we would love to send your way to help you and for us to be able to connect with you. Make sure to stay connected with us throughout the week on Facebook and Instagram. Make sure to like and subscribe and share our social media accounts. We believe that church is more than just a building or a Sunday experience. We look forward to connecting with you online and in person. Thanks again for being with us today.